Okay, I think we uh, should start. Because we have a nice time, fixed time schedule to do certain things. Uh, as you know, tonight we present the latest publication by V2, written by Arjen Muller. It's this publication that you probably already saw at the entrance of the space, called From Image to Interaction. It's a follow-up on, on the former uh, book uh, we published from Ian Muller called Understanding Media Theory, a uh, rather popular booklet uh, which is sold out in the meantime. And after we did the research, we figured out that it is used about 15 different universities worldwide as a kind of reference point for reflecting and shaping media art theory and practices. The latest publication starts where the former publication ended. In the introduction of the book, Ian writes about that, this book is a reconstruction of art history that shows where the interactive media art of today comes from and where, they, where it might take us. The book emphasizes on agency. It says, agency is a new responsibility. It has overcome the passivity of both the technical visual media like photography and cinema and video, as well as the passivity of the conceptual arts from Duchamp to Saint Louis. He also recoins the notion of meaning in art and expands it with the notion of agency as being fundamental to our experience of what art is and can do. If the artwork doesn't provide us with agency, it means nothing to us. That's a quote from Ian. The question, of course, is what kind of agency is Ian Mulder looking at? It's not just about having an opinion about an artwork or consuming it, nor is it solely about public participation. This agency is about producing new forms and structures while engaging interactive artworks. To introduce you to the basic ideas of this book, we have invited three experts tonight that will comment and reflect on some of the concepts that Ian Mulder develops in his publication. I emphasize on develops because I think the book, when you go through it and read it, it's a kind of an adventure, adventurous book, uh, taking you from one step to the other. Uh, often not within, how do you call that, the range of steps that you would think. I'll, short you, I'll shortly introduce you to the three speakers tonight in chronological order, so you have a little bit of an idea how it will be done. The first uh, introduction of the book tonight will be done by Sibe Thyssen. Uh, Sibe is uh, Director for Public Art at the Center for Visual Arts in Rotterdam. He studied philosophy at Erasmus University. Sibe, Sibe will also be the moderator of tonight and guide you through the different positions of the presentations you will hear. The second presentation will be done by Ian Mulder on the left side. It's nice, right side, left side, so we get already positions here. And Ian has a background in biology, but he's best known for his writings on media theory over the last 20 years. He's an editor also for De Gids. Uh, some of you might know it. Uh, people from abroad might might not know the Ritz because I think it's only published in Dutch. It's an interdisciplinary magazine, you could say, for science, philosophy, and culture. He's also a co-writer and a co-editor for all of the V2 publications, and he teaches at different art schools in Netherlands and Belgium. After the second speaker, we have a short break of 10 minutes. You can get a coffee, get something fresh, and after the break, we continue with Katja Kwastek, who is on the right side again. Uh, she's from Germany, and she was the vice director at the Boltzmann Institute for Media Art Research. She finished her PhD recently on the aesthetics of interaction in digital art. Next to being a researcher, she's also a curator and writer on media art. After Katja, we switch to Fritz. Of course, he's on the left side of the space. Uh, Fritz, you might know, he's uh, uh, the head curator of uh, the photo museum on the other side of the river. Um, he's also a writer of, for example, the book Experience the Media Rat Race and writing on essays on visual culture, which in fact is something that I translated as visual culture, but it should be built culture, but it's hardly to translate that. Visual culture is a little bit different from what we call built culture in the Netherlands. So, after the presentations, we have a short interview uh, between Ian and uh, Sibe, because all the presentations will also formulate a question after having read the book, and those questions will be uh, talked about uh, in the last session we do here. After that, 
which is around one uh, quarter to 10, we leave this space, we all together go to the V2 space uh, where Edwin van der Heide uh, will show uh, an exhibition that we're running at the moment, and which is a nice, I would say, step from talking all night into an interactive artwork. So I hope we have uh, some lively discussions uh, tonight, and I hand the word to our moderator tonight, Sibbe. Go ahead, Sibbe. I'm not sure if there's much to moderate tonight because there are so many speakers. And we'll see. I will start with an uh, introduction. No, I'll keep it like this. I had to dig deep into my files to, in order to find out when I first met Ian Mulder. That was 17 years ago. In the 80s and 90s, Mulder was part of an obscure writer's collective called Bilwet, Beweging voor Illegale Wetenschappen, or in English, a Dilkno, Foundation for the Advancement, Advancement of Illegal Knowledge. This Amsterdam-based group produced the most fascinating account of the Dutch Quarter Movement ever published, Bewegingsleer, and compiled the first introduction to media theory in the Netherlands, Mediaarchief. Consequently, they published their Datendindy in German, an adventurous exploration of media culture combined with small yet marvelous essays on Leni Riefenstahl, Hergé, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. The Dutch version only appeared on a 1.4 MB floppy disk. How cute if you think about it now. I loved Bewegingsleer, considered Media Archief a difficult, however fascinating book, and finally I had to admit, I was just not smart enough to understand the datum dindy. I was not able to cope with their velocity. Apparently my brain was formatted in a different texture. Bilbert produced more books and articles, but I considered the early 90s as their golden period, doing what no one was doing yet. Bilbert had moved from DIY pirate and Samish Dutch culture into media theory, leaving the 20th century, and me, far behind. They started talking about media. I could only think of the media, newspapers, radio, television. They started talking about net reality. I only had an MS-DOS computer, treating it like an advanced typewriter. They started talking about net criticism. I thought they meant a critique of technology. They started talking about information as continuous flows of data. I thought information and meaning were synonymous. To cut it short, what the fuck were these smart guys talking about? From what techno planet did they arrive here amongst us, simple, media, illiterate human beings? A few years later, in 1994, Bilwet did Der Daten tour in Holland and Germany, a kind of standoff philosophy show, marketing a new book, taking their illegal knowledge from beyond fringe culture to more established realms, like debating center de Uni here at Rotterdam. According to my notes, the audience here consisted of six people, probably, like me, pretending to be cool enough to attend a serious evening of media theory. <laughs> Thinking back, I remember all three members, Arie Mulder, Geert Loving, Lex Wouterloot, having smiles on their faces all night. Were they tricksters? Was it arrogance? Or were we, the desperate six, just irritated by their smiles since we had a hard time digging the essence of this performance? I think they knew they were light years ahead of us. They did not feel sorry for us. However, they probably thought we were human, all too human. After Bilwet evaporated, net critic Geert Lovink and writer Arjen Mulder found a new home in the V2 publishing house. Like Bilwet, V2 was also born in the squatters movement. And like Bilwet, V2, V2 had also moved from analog DIY culture into the mediaspora of interactive art, unstable media, net criticism, and digital philosophy. Illegal knowledge had become media theory, shared with and taught to an increasing population of young students dealing with interactivity in the arts, with media reflexivity, and longing for a media-specific art history, providing contemporary agencies and practices a locus and understanding in time and space. Tonight we are launching Arjen Mulder's second volume in the V2 series, From Image to Interaction, Meaning and Agency in the Arts. Its predecessor, Understanding Media Theory, has become a necessary guide in this domain. The book presented a kind of historical overview and offered a new vocabulary for students and artists. However, from media to interaction is far more than just a follow-up. It is much more. I would like to call this work an instead of. 
let me explain this a little further. In 1893, political philosopher Benjamin Tucker published this Instead of a Book. It was subtitled, by the way, by a man too busy to write one. In his preface, <coughs> in his preface Tucker argues, and I quote, a book, properly speaking, is first of all a thing of unity and symmetry, of order and finish. It is literary structure, each part of which is subordinated to the whole and created for it, end of quote. On the contrary, instead of a book, Tucker continues, is just an assemblage within a cover. It is not a structure. It offers a more or less coherent arrangement, a series of afterthoughts, each part created for itself, almost without reference to any other part, yet coherence in its chosen compilation. The instead of is a genre I particularly like, as it offers the reader more opportunities to interact with the writer, since a fixed scientific or methodological structure is absent. As such, there is no scientific exclusion, exclusionism, no need to exclude data that doesn't fit into a verifiable hypothesis. In such a concept, in principle, anything goes. Theory and history are not valued as fixed, unchangeable, and canonized categories. However, they are embraced as dynamic and flowing clusters of data, as agencies waiting to be reconnected and reassembled. In short, there are many, many ways to talk about the world. Explored by authors like Charles Ford, Paul Feyerabend, and William Burroughs, the instead of method was employed by Bill Wett, by Critical Art Ensemble, by Eric Davis, Kotja Eschoon, Lars Spijbroek, and Mark Schuilenburg, only to mention a few writers known in this house, all protagonists of smart science par excellence. This is how I experience from image to interaction. Mulder's practice resembles the artist's practice. They both create. Mulder does not represent art history. He creates an art history for contemporary art without a history. He creates a vocabulary for art practices that lack theory. Nor does he pretend to offer a new art theory, another art history, or a distinct form of art criticism. No, he invites artists and students to employ the same method, that is, to create a possible and coherent set of references in order to offer a work of art text and context. It is theory as agency, as interface, as creative practice. Instead of art history, instead of art philosophy, Instead of art criticism, Mulder has written from image to interaction. Twelve years ago, I did an interview with Arjen for a Dutch-Belgian magazine. Here he elaborated on his method of research and writing, and I quote, I want to be part of what I'm researching. I'm not interested in being objective. Consequently, I'm not interested in making a theory operational. If a theory works, I throw it away. I consider theory a joyful process of creative thinking. And yes, from image to interaction breeds a love of art history, especially painting, and a love of theory, especially his own. There are no pictures included, so you have to rely totally on your poor brain cells. Mulder unravels notions of agency, interface, and interaction, and criticizes traditional qualities of meaning and form in the arts. He will explain his motives and perspectives here in a few moments. But Mulder also offers new ways of looking at artists like Paul Klee and Piet Mondrian, Although the idea of a notion of media theory was not known to them, he convinces us that their contributions to media theory have been significant. I hope Mulder will elaborate on this theme in his introduction also. Later this evening, Katja Kostek of Fritz Giersbergen, as Alex said, will further explore aspects of his book, linking his thoughts to contemporary aesthetic and photographic experiences. In a non-explicit way, Arjen Mulder has written a remarkable optimistic book, He's optimistic about tendencies and developments within the art community today. Interactivity or interaction, in Mulder's opinion, have nothing to do with data roaming persons glued to computers and smartphones. However, interaction is an innovative social and political process, producing new forms of behavior and sociability, shaping today's and tomorrow's world. In the same sense, he does not consider an interface an electronic device. Like interaction, the notion of interface, being between faces describes our current social state of being in a shared media intertwined in environment as a philosophical or existential position. From image to interaction, thus de-abstracts the clinical nature of media theory by bringing in the social. Later I will talk with Aryan about his new book, but now it's time to meet the author himself. Why did he write a book about meaning and agency in the arts? How are they related to each other? 
Has art become meaningless? Or are we supposed to situate meaning somewhere else today? How did interaction change the art? How did interaction change us? And how will interaction change the world we live in? Serious questions indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arya Milder. Thank you. Uh, I'll put up my jacket. Sorry. I'm not going to answer all these questions. That's too difficult for me. But because there are no images in the book, I decided to give you an introduction with only images. Right? I selected some 80 of them. No, 70. Um, and I'll try to show some lines that are in the book. The book is um, developed while writing, and there are all sorts of lines running through it, but I, I will get, uh, try to get one or two out, and then uh, you, know, you get the general drift. And okay. I take in my book uh, McLuhan's claim, it's this McLuhan year this year, right? He's 100 years ago he was uh, born. I take his claim that um, seriously that in order to understand media, you have to study their effects and not the, the intention of the people who, who use them or who work with them. And the effects is, as, as, as I see it, uh, a matter of emotions, uh, but mostly of experience, right? And what I try to do in the book is I try to find a way to combine knowledge about how media function and uh, what kind of effects they create with the kind of experiences they produce. And I try to figure out what kind of experiences are connected with what kind of media. And, um, but the point of view is always that from interaction, of interactive art. And I'll, I'll start with introducing interactive art. Uh, I won't go into this one. This is the, a painting that I happened to come across when I was researching something else, of Robert Rauschenberg from 1961. And it's, as far as I know, the first interactive artwork, at least the one that I could find. Out. It's a painting that says, you know, one way, there's a, an arrow coming out. There are these four sort of blocks in the middle, and then there's a rope going down to the trunk. And the idea of Rauschenberg was in 61, I put in four objects, right? I closed the trunk. I put in four objects. They're numbered A, B, C, D. You open, as a visitor, you open the trunk, you get out one of the objects and you put in your own object. And then you write on one of these, a, or one, two, three, four, I maybe, on one of these, the thing you took out, you took, let's say, number two, and then on number two you write, I took out this and I put in that, right? Which is like an exchange. This is the simplest form of, and the most fundamental form of interaction I could figure out. The funny thing, of course, is that nowadays, you know, the, 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 I, uh, it was too heavy for the audience because first they thought, wait a minute, I can take along a real Robert Rauschenberg for free, right? So the four items were removed very quickly. And then the, the people who did that said, oh, I have to write in a Robert Rauschenberg painting. You know, they didn't dare to do it. So it was a complete failure, right? And it, it's now it's in the museum. You can't even, you're not even allowed to open the trunk, right? So it's a sort of monument to interactivity instead of a, an interactive artwork. Now, the funny thing is that two years later in, in Brazil, you had Ligia Clark, who had been struggling with Piet Mondrian for over 10 years. And then she came up with a new idea, a grand idea. She said, this is the, the new kind of artworks I'm going to do uh, called Caminando Walking. You know, you take a strip of paper, you can do it at home, you take a strip of paper from the newspaper, you turn one side and then you glue them together, you get a Möbius strip and then you put in the scissor and you start to cut. That's the artwork. So the object itself doesn't have any value, which makes, you know, the problem that R Rauschenberg uh, met is solved basically. It isn't. But you have to do something. If you don't do anything, you just have a silly strip of paper and a scissor on the table, right? So you have to do something. And what you do is something very strange. Uh, you know, do it at home. The experience is really weird because it becomes longer and longer and longer. And you have all these funny associations going on in your head. My God, my life is a Mobius strip and I'm just <laughs> cutting it off. <laughs> okay. Uh, she developed, uh, Ligia Clark, the Brazilian artist, uh, developed her 
ideas of interactivity further also not just one person with one object but also two persons you do you know, have to put on these funny coveralls and then you have to remove zippers and touch each other etc it's a rather therapeutic thing anyway Rauschenberg uh, in uh, when, when was that I wrote it down in 68 he made the real what we nowadays call responsive environment right in the museum, it's, you know, it, it looks like this if, if you're active. If you don't do anything, it's a mirror, right? You stand there, you see this big mirror. It's really huge. It's as really huge as this wall. It's about three meters high and one meter thick. You stand there, you know, and you look at yourself. And then you think, you know, why the hell is it called soundings? So you maybe produce a sound. And if you do this, one lamp will go on and you see a, a chair, right? And then you start to think, you know, what will happen if I, ra uh, if I shout? Uh, and then suddenly three go on, right? And then you try, <coughs> and then, you know, there's a, a dance of chairs starting. And then you think, you know, maybe I can find somebody here in the museum to help me. So it's in Cologne. In, in Cologne, so I asked the girl who was happened to go, could you help me? What do you, do you want me to do? We are going to shout together. And she ran off, <laughs> right? Later, two old ladies <laughs> said, I, we, we can applaud if you like, you know. And then the school class passed, and the school class made the whole thing come alive, right? It's a very strange thing, because you see this. It's basically, you have all this, you have to do a sort of anti-museum type behavior, you know, start shouting in a museum. And then what you get back for it is chairs, you know, photographs of chairs on three planes. And they're, you know, it's very cleverly done. It's here he is building it. Oh, it's not so good. Maybe this one is a bit, well, you know. Go to Colonia, you, you should have it. Anyway, this is the start of the sort of installation art, interactive art, uh, installation interactive art, which had a, you know, the, the idea is always the same. You have to do something that you're not supposed to do, and then something happens. This is uh, a work from Ulrike Gabriel from 19, when was it? When did she do it? 1994, terrain. There's somebody sitting at the back. These are little ropes, little robots moving along, All right? And what you do is you have your the thing on your brain. It measures the me the, the movements of the, the EEG in your brain, the, the alpha waves. And um, the less you think, the less alpha wave you have, the more light you will see on on these on this thing, and the robots will start to move. Right, so the, 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 the interaction is you don't use your brain, <laughs> and then it will happen. And then, of course, you hear the thing, they make, they produce sound too, <coughs> so you think, what's happening? And then, <laughs> it stops here. Very cleverly done. This is the guy with the thing on his head. Yeah, this is basically how most people do it in the West. <laughs> no, I, uh, she told me once that in Japan, people could keep their eyes open and get it functioning. You need a, an awful lot of Zen, apparently, to, to do it. Anyway, that's the, the st my starting point. It's interactive art in its different forms, and not specifically uh, electronic interactive art, but any interactive art, including you know cutting paper, like Lydia Clark proposed. I described a couple of more projects in the book. And then I thought, you know, OK, let's try to figure out the interactive aspects of painting. That was my first question. You know, is there anything in painting that's interactive? As far as I knew, not. But when I started to study it, it turned out that there's quite a bit of interaction in it. Basically, modern painting started with a, a guy called Alberti who wrote in the 1450s a book about painting. And he has a very simple theory. He says, you know, what is a painting? Well, you have a base. And then you have a, uh, you draw a lines, and with the lines that you draw, you make silhouettes, right? And then you have the sketches, and then you cut them out, sort of, and then you organize them into a nice grouping, into a composition. That's what you put on your, <coughs> on your base, on your whether it's wood or, or any other material that they were th using. And then you put in the colors, right? So you have lines and colors, and then you have a painting. You know, very simple theory. I don't know why it took them so long to figure that one out. Now, since then, this has basically been painting up until 400 years later. The funny thing is if you look at uh, you know, uh, the masterpiece of the Renaissance like this, 
and Michelangelo thing, you see that Michelangelo drew very nice lines around everything that he drew, the legs, the arms, the whatever. And then he filled in the colors, right? This is the idea of painting, right? Here, you see very clear lines, and then he has the silhouettes, and then, okay. You can make the lines softer if you like, as, uh, as Da Vinci did, but basically it's the same uh, idea. You know, okay, you draw the line, you have to you, you make the silhouettes, you have the forms, you create the forms, and then you fill in the colors. Now, the next step takes us uh, some f 400 years later when Kandinsky says, you know, this doesn't work anymore. Everybody's bored in the museum. If you, if you go there, you see all these, you know, all these lines and all these colors and, and all these persons. And you say, hey, there's Jesus Christ on the cross. Ah, that's uh, my art, great. Yeah, that's the famous uh, Graf von uh, Oldenburg or whatever, right? He said, this doesn't work. We should change it, you know? And he tried, it, it took him uh, quite a long time to figure out how to do it. Here you still have lines and colors, but everything is going wild, right? This is from 1910, I think. This is a bit later. And then he finds it, how to do it in, I think this is one of the first where he really manages to do it. Now, what he does is he says, okay, you have lines and you have colors. This is, you know, art in, art in images is basically lines and colors, but you don't need to draw the lines to make forms, right? You can use them in any way you like. You, you use colors as bright as you can or as dumb, uh, as, as, as cool as you can or whatever, as, uh, depending on the kind of artwork you want to make, and then you put in lines to, to bring action into it or sometimes even leaves out your lines. And the funny thing is, if you look at the, at the you, you, sh there are a couple of them here in, the, in Rotterdam in the museum. If you look at the, one of these wild Kandinsky's from between 1910 and 1914, you know, he had his really his psychedelic time because they go utterly wild. And the funny thing is, how do you look at a painting like that? Well, what you do is you, you have to adapt your eyes all the time and then you see that they are full of forms, but you can't say, you know, this is about this or that. There are no clear forms, but you can find any forms you like, right? Depending on, you know, the distance towards the painting or the way you adjust your eyes to the painting. And then you see lots of comic, you know, animation type figures, but also bo boats sailing away, trees, have all clouds, whatever. You know, the story goes on endlessly. Basically, he had found uh, Kandinsky a sort of method to make all forms, right, in one painting. And this painting, can you see some of them like here? There are quite a few Kandinsky's with apparently psychoactive mushrooms on them. You know, and here's the psychoactive mushroom leaving, leading you into some dark hole out there. Anyway, I, he's a Russian, but uh, the literature is very silent on this point, right? And here, uh, yeah, well, anyway. The funny thing is that the same aesthetics that Kandinsky figured out by using lines and using colors was picked up some f 60 years later by video art, right? This is uh, Namjoon Pike in the 1970s, I think it is. The little global group, 73. Uh, he uses the same aesthetics as um, Kandinsky does, you know, lines, colors. There are, well, you know, um, sort of big figures, but very vague. They are independent of each other and they're working together to create this idea of the, the transforming image. All forms keep on transforming, right? So there is a direct line, so to speak, between Kandinsky and um, Pike and actually the entire video art. Video art is always about the transforming image, right? It's not about depicting things, it's about the transformation of the image itself, which I thought was pretty revealing. I had never thought of it. Now, Kandinsky was also a theory person. He wrote a couple of books, but the main ones is, th is this one. is the first, Uber das Geist on the spiritual in the art, which is basically about the theory of colors. And it, the theory is very interesting because he explains what kind of experiences are created by what kind of colors, right? So the blue is, is very arrogant and you, it pushes you away. The red pushes, draws you towards it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how the hell did you know? But he describes it wonderfully. And he also wrote this book, Point to Line to Plane, in which he describes his experiments that he did on Bauhaus with points. It took him 40 pages to describe the point, a point on a, 
if you, if you write, you said, and you put a point, it's the end of something. In drawing, the point is the beginning, right? You put a point and then you draw the line. And that sort of theory, it it's amazing to read. I thought it is really media theory of a higher level than Leonardo da Vinci wrote it. And again, this is the idea that you find in video art, like here we have Pike again doing a Zen line with his head. And then later on he did it on the television, right? I produced a line. So art is basically about colors and lines. Now, I came across the works of Paul Klee. This is from his book, Pedag Pedagogic Sketchbook, I think it's called, from 1925. And the book is mostly about lines again. And Klee has a fascinating theory of lines. He says, you know, if you start to draw a line, the line, you know, on any point, the line can go in any direction. So you choose what, you know, so the line is very much alive as long as you draw it, right? That's the upper thing, you know? And you don't know what it will do. So suddenly it makes an angle, right? Then he says, if you draw more lines, you start to create planes, like, right? And then something, something funny happens to the line because the line dies and the plane starts to live, right? You start to look at the plane instead of the line around it, okay? And what he says then is that in drawings and in art in general, time is connected to the line because it takes time to draw it, but it also take time, takes time to view it with your eyes. You have to follow it, yeah. But a plane doesn't need time to be looked at because you see it in once, right? And then he says, well, you know, there is something between the line and the plane that's called the medial line that is, it is a, a plane, but you can still see the different lines doing things. I'll give you an example of it. Clay, Clay is a very fascinating guy. He started doing this sort of drawings with his right hand, this sort of satire, stupid, basically. And then he, started, he, sa he decided to become a modern artist, and he stopped drawing with his right hand and started to draw with his left hand, right? And he draw really bad with his left hand, which went up to this kind of works. Now, not, uh, the other one is maybe a bit too... Oh, hmm, dark. Anyway, if you follow this one, right, the line goes, uh, you know, you start in the left corner up, the line moves down to the, to the end of the dress here, and then it moves to the hand maybe, or a finger, and then it moves to that finger, and then maybe to that feet. You know, the line, it is one line, and it's one figure. This is a good example of a medial line. You know, the line is active, you have to follow it with your eyes, and then you see what kind of special thing clay is giving us in this, it's not so much, a, a, you know, you don't, who cares about the gesture, it's about the line that's doing it. And this kind of idea of bringing time into the image through the line, we find in Amsterdam, real time by, you know, a media ar artwork by Esther Polak, <coughs> where all the lines are drawn by people walking on the streets in Amsterdam with a GPS, they send their signal to the central computer and it draws their lines of their movements, right? So this is again, time brought into the artwork through the line. It's time-based art and time-based art needs lines. That was the discovery. But there's another thing about it too. It means, because if planes don't have time, right? what about photography? Now, take a very good photograph by August Sander. You know, are there lines in it? Well, you can say, you know, here's a line. It's not really a line, that's also a plane. The, a photograph is a plane, right? You see it in one view, off. And then, you know, you, why not consider more details in the plane, but you see it at once, right? So there is no time in photography, which makes sense because you do it in like one hundredth or thousandth of a second. But there's also no time in the reception of the image. That's what I'm trying to say through Paul Clay, you know? Here you have lines and still, you know, it's not about the lines. Nobody's going to follow the lines with their eyes. It's about the right? There are photographers who understand the plane very well, right? Uh, my favorite photographer is William Klein. You know, a plane like this of the girl's body is, is huge, doesn't have any meaning, except that it's a plane. It, it goes even beyond this, where you can hardly see what's going on. You only see planes, right? He understood the, how it functioned, and if you put the planes behind each other, you know, you can create a sort of space in the photograph. Right? Here's another one with a line, it's the horizontal line. But still, of course, this is not the point. Now, so that was a, an interesting outcome of my research. It means that in media art or in interactive art, we sh have nothing 
to find or to win by, by studying photography, right? Because photography is about planes and we are about lines, right? Which means that basically the entire visual culture, as we know it today, is not interested, is interesting from the point of view of media art or interactive art. You can use it, but it's not about, okay. We'll have to discuss this later with Keith. Now, starting with the line and the activated line, you can do a lot with it. Like Calder, he started to you know, use the, make the line of uh, iron thread and then start to make movable objects, right? So you can use the line to make things move. You can create a space through which these balls can move with their lines, right? And they are very clever, actually. You should look at YouTube movies with callers. You know, if you do, for example, here, in the left-hand corner, suddenly the uh, counterintuitive, the one on the other side, just one lifts, something like that. You know, they are very clever. I would love to study all the entire Clark uh, Calder oeuvre. But it's about, you know, the line as in the thing that makes move, that, that makes movement and that introduces time into the art world. Now, an interesting other approach to the line, I found it in a, uh, an artist from Venezuela, Gego, who used lines like this, you know, small iron lines, and, you know, click them together to build structures, right? She did it like, she, with this sort of, she had a very special system organized for it to, to click the line onto each other. And while in the, in the uh, gallery space or the museum, she built up these forms with the lines, with a little, uh, with her uh, all the stuff she took along, and then she even built this huge ret reticularia, as they, they are called, you know, huge networks of lines, right? She, this one is, I think, from something like 1969, right? She built these huge networks. Now, networks of lines, uh, where do we know this from? Well, <coughs> basically, she built a metaphor of the internet long before we had it, right? Which is something I find pretty amazing. But it's also the sort of things that this is from uh, the Nobotic Research, a big int internationally oriented installation called uh, Tendencies, which is all about lines, movements, and connections, and they use the internet as their network, right? So here again, we see the, the line as the, the expression of time, but also as the thing that creates time or brings time into the art world, right? So if we talk about um, interactive art or media, I use the term interactive art because it describes the agency that the work allows, right? Uh, instead of saying like video art or machine art or electronic art, which describes the technology, but the technology changes so quickly that you know, it's, it's a lost cause, as video art is basically over, because video is over. But anyway, so I prefer il interactive art, but okay, if we're into interactive art, you can't say that there is a split, as, it, as the old theory went, that there is a deep split between all the earlier art and the new technolo technological art, as Peter Weibel described it, no. There is a, a continuity, and one of the continuities is the line, right? The line as the as the vector of time. Okay. Um, uh, the next line, I will be a bit shorter about this one. This is uh, Mondrian, right? Mondrian said, okay, so a painting is lines and colors. Oh, easy, so to speak. You know, I put, I just take two lines, this, the horizontal and the vertical one, and only three colors. In blue, you don't see the blue very well. Yellow and red, right? And then you start to combine. Uh, or you, or if you leave out the colors too, right? And the great thing about Mondrian is, you know, if once, uh, if, if you grow up in Holland, Mondrian is very boring because you see him all the time, but once you get to into him, he is very good, right? Because thi uh, like this one is not boring when you stand in front of it because the lines are full of uh, strange tension. He said, you know, I, I don't draw straight lines. I just connect all the curved lines into one line and then it becomes straight, right? So there's a maximum of tension in the line. And then if you do it the right way, you know, if you, if you turn it a bit, right, the painting and put it as a, it's very boring again, but in this case, it's okay. So what is art about? What is a, an image about? It's about the relationship between the elements <coughs> in the picture, right? In the, in, on the base, on the carrier. 
it's the relationship between the colors and the relationship between the lines. So art is about relationships. He hated lines actually, and he finally made this one, uh, the victory boogie boogie, and the victory was not that uh, we were going to win the war, it was 1943, who knew? It was that he managed to get the line out of his work and everything had become color and plain because he hated time in a way. Right? Mondrian wrote an incredible oeuvre of work. The, this, it's, uh, it's all in English. You can find it in Dutch, funny enough. And he talks about it in, you know, uh, he has this very peculiar uh, repertoire of words that he uses to describe what he's trying to do, this dynamic equilibrium and all sorts of terms. But it's basically all about the relation. The new art, the new life is, the new art is about relations and the new life is about relations too. You know, we have to reorganize our society, he says in the book, in order to make equal, you know, get a dynamic equilibrium within our society. Okay, relations, that's the word, relationships, you know, as in Ligia Clark creating relationships between these two people who are touching her, as in this video artwork of uh, Nam Yoon Pai, you know, here's the statue of Buddha, there's the video, there is a relationship between the two, the two, you know, who cares about the image, who cares about the television, but the relationship between them is very interesting. He made hundreds of them, you know. Every time he found a Buddha be, uh, statue, we put a television in front of it, and then get another one. <coughs> but it's all about the relationship, right? Now, there's a very strange word, yeah, well, it's a bit like this, if you enter it, by Gary Hill, called, uh, stri uh, wait a minute, I have to do it right, Tall Ships, uh, 1992. You enter a dark corridor and if you walk in, the people come and sort of, you know, the video images of these people, I think there are 12, six on one side, six on one, the other, and one at the very end, the trial at the very end. And if you walk in, they move towards you, right? And then they look around, you know, is somebody there? They don't look at you. They look around and then, okay. So it's again, this one is about the relationship, but the funny thing is it looks as if it's, as if it's interactive, right? Because the artwork is responding to you when you move in but it isn't because you can't somehow make a contact with these people who can be very close and even, you know, stare at you. And then there's this child at the end, it's like a spooky sort of image, right? Some people are, you know, this is one who's in front, you know, it's a very strange sort of work, but it's, it's like, it's a simulation of interactivity, right? It seems as if there's happening something, but you can't get a connection with them, which is a, it makes it into a really, know, classic one. The guy who first, as far as I can find out, made the connection between, make it, made it possible to have a direct connection with the screen was this Myron Kruger, who wrote a book about it, Artificial Reality 2. Uh, well, at first there was one, but anyway. He describes the, the, the work he did in 71, which is called Psychic Space. What it's, a, it's like a room, you entered it, you know, this was 71, nobody knew about computers. The, the mouse uh, was invented, uh, I think, two years earlier by Doug Engelbart, but you know, no, nobody knew. Nobody knew what the cursor was either, right? So what happened was you entered it and then you saw this uh, pl playing up there mo uh, in the back of the room. And if you walk towards it, it opened into a sort of maze and you were supposed to, you, you Apparently you found out rather quickly, even though he talks about it takes a few minutes to let the audience, you know, understand what's happening. And nowadays it would take you like one second. And then you have to move your dot through the uh, maze, right? And you do it by moving your body, right? So you have to step a bit, uh, and then, and then you know? it's very clumsy, right? So everybody starts to cheat after a minute, right? Because they try to get over lines, right? And then the lines move with you, right? And the more you do it, the more lines appear and the more complicated it becomes, right? So there's a, a sort of game going on, you know. It's basically about learning how to use a mouse and, a and move a cursor along an interface, but <coughs> he made it into a game and the, the, the game ended by that there were so many lines that you couldn't move anymore. And then suddenly everything evaporated, right? It's a sort of the ultimate counter game. You can't win. And if you finally m do manage to win, you lose everything, right? Very cleverly done. 
which is, as far as I can see, the first really interactive art. It's about the body of the user and the thing on the screen and how they relate and how they make together relationship and how they change each other, right? Because both the the thing on the, the, the projection is changing, but also the, the way you move through the space. <coughs> okay. Now, let's skip this one, right? I'll sort of end it up here, right? I'll move this summary right in interactive art as I see it you have three different forms you have this one which I call the object based interactivity the object I call a relational object it's the thing that you know you have to do something with to you have to relate to it and it relates to you and then the art effect happens it can be the thing like this or uh, you know in another thing of DJ Clark it's this network that you're supposed to do with a group, etc. That's what I call relation, uh, object based interactivity. The second form is the sort of thing that um, Myron Kruger invented where you, you, know, you have to move the cursor along. Now, he, with him, you had to do it with your body. Nowadays, the cursor is more or less a little activated person that you have to move along and let things do. So, this is what I call cursor based interactivity. I don't go very deeply into game theory, it was too much for me because it would have taken me another year, but anyway. And the third kind of, oh, oh I skipped, uh, I skipped uh, this sort of interactivity, but you know, it doesn't have images basically, which is the situation-based interactivity where you do social projects, right? Which is a form of interactivity. I'm, I'm also quite short about it in the book. And then there's another form of interactivity, which is probably you see it better which is where you let, through an interactive process, you let a form appear, which is uh, what I call formational interactivity. Right, so at the end of the line, oh, here's, no, here's some, here is some socially or, or situation oriented interactivity. Mm, not very clear. <coughs> so by studying both uh, painting and their own media theory and photography and I, I sort of make an argument it's slowly developed while writing the book here from that we have moved from an age of images to look at to an age of works where you can interact with you need interaction which raises the question as you mentioned of meaning because the old idea was that you know a painting or whatever has a meaning you have to get it out it's the intention of the artist etc etc and I say, uh, at, and I thought, you know, the, the argument is simple in the beginning, you have meaning at the end, you have agency. But then while working on it, you know, I had to conclude that you, if you don't have agency, you don't have meaning. So in painting, you have agency, which is in the lines, the folding of the lines, the finding out of the relationships. And there are some more that I describe in the book. So you can say that, is a, that it has agency, so it has meaning. In photography, there is very little agency in the image itself, you can ma imagine a lot about what happened before and after it, but in the image itself, there's hardly any lines or any other thing that uh, might produce meaning. So there's hardly any agency left there. And then we get to, so it's basically a different line in the development. And then we get to the sort <coughs> of interactive installations that, uh, that P2 is all about, where you have agency as the main basic problem of the artwork stick to that now, for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, possible, because it's also the topic of Iensberg. Uh, and I'm also here for two reasons, because in addition to the many links of my area of research with the topic of Ian's book, I do also have a kind of institutional relation to it, because it was published with financial support of a prize that Ian got, um, Ian together with V2, got as a winner of the pre Ars Electronica Media Art Research 2008, 2008, which was offered by the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute Media Art Research, for which I was acting as vice director at that time. And of course, it's a great pleasure to see that the prize money could help to support the publication of a new book so fast. 
and this time again a monograph by Ayn himself and not an edited collection as the interact or die catalog. But still I would like to come back for uh, a second to the interact or die catalog and to quote a section of the jury statement at that time. Um, it highlighted that this work does not focus primarily on a final theory, but rather on an ongoing thinking process within a network of experts. Alongside human-computer interaction, organic life forms, processual architecture and system theory, as well as the social ethic and effective dimensions of interactivity are taken into consideration. So this is interesting because from image to interaction shares two features with interact or die. It also addresses us as witnesses of an ongoing thinking process and invites us to think ourselves. and I think we heard a little bit of that approach already. And it also presents, a, it, as interact or die, it presents a very original approach to modern and contemporary art and culture. But whereas interact or die emphasizes processes which you may call processes of emergence through interaction, in from image to interaction, it is the processuality of meaning making that is observed in paintings, photography, and interactive art alike. So if already the interact or die catalog pursued a quite unconventional approach to the topic of interaction, from image to interaction constitutes even more of a challenge to us art historians, if there is an us feeling at all in that discipline. Ayan is eager to stress that the book is not about art history and that he does not consider it as um, part of the discipline, that's what he says. Nevertheless, the book, as you heard, highlights various moments in 500 years of artistic practice while suggesting, if not an evolutionary argument, then at least relations between the different moments in history. So what makes this book different from an art historian's approach, we have to ask. You might say that it's these like crazy jumps that he uh, does from 500 years forward and back, but he describes that what distinguishes his approach from the art historians is that it is artistic research through theory because, as he states, it adds the dimension of feeling to the historian's approach. Well, as an historian of interactive art, at least, I'm used to consider feeling or at least subjectivity as an important part also of any epistemolo epistemological process, and therefore I would not strictly exclude this category from my research praxis. But I think what Ayn wants to emphasize and what qualifies this book as artistic approach is exactly what he describes as aesthetic quality of interactive art in the book. It is the potential, and I again quote a, a notion of Ayn, of the potential of the third mind of something emerging between recipient and work that exceeds both. So also in the book, something can emerge between reader and text that exceeds a mere following of logical arguments. His book may contain and does contain provocations, disruptions, and points of disagreement, but especially through those, he encourages new thoughts on the side of the reader. So let me thus take the freedom to respond to Ayan's book in a comparable way, to take some key points that especially caught my individual interest because of my own background and to tell you why this is so. And I was asked to focus on the interactive part of it, the interactive part of it, because that's what I'm researching. And I wanted to make a preliminary remark, but maybe that already got through, but which is very important for those who did not read the book yet. Uh, because interactive art for Ayan definitely is not interactive media art only. Interactive art, his examples range from Duchamp via Happening and Kinetic Art to video art and new media art. I think this is important uh, to mention, especially in the context of the two publications, because you might think this is an institute mainly interested in uh, or focusing on media or new media art. Uh, but I think this is also something that makes this book really important, as I said, not to make this clear cut between the traditional art and new media art, but to look at relations and, um, and to, to put the two into a kind of um, bigger picture. So interactive art really, uh, interactive media art is a part 
of interactive art, but it's not at all what media, the whole media art. Okay, now to some key points. And I just um, have some uh, quotes from the book because I thought that might be interesting for those who didn't read it yet. And my first point is an argument that departs from Duchamp's ready-mades. The behavior Duchamp elicits is a way of seeing. Looked at it in a certain manner, an object trouvé is a work of art. Looked at all other objects with the same gaze afterwards, outside the museum too, and you will see there is nothing but art. I would like to focus on this point for a minute because it touches a really important aspect of aesthetic experience, which is the readiness of the viewer. Um, in the moment in which art crosses the boundaries of the everyday, be it through object art happenings or invitations to interact, the attitude of the recipient becomes even more important. Already in the 1930s, the American philosopher John Dewey has pointed out that aesthetic experience is dependent on the readiness of the recipient, on his attitude, his willingness for intense perception. Dewey points out that aesthetic experience requires a particular type of observation on the part of the recipient. The artwork is not automatically experienced aesthetically. You might just browse through or go through a museum chatting with a friend or whatever, but only when the recipient permits and actively produces this kind of experience. And um, this uh, second part of the quotation that everything might seem like art is really interesting also, I think, in, uh, in the context of what I'm studying because really you see that especially interactive art can um, provoke this kind of experience that you may call cathartic, cathartic because it changes your awareness of your surroundings. There is an, um, a famous example by David Rokeby, you may know his very nervous system, this uh, interactive environment, an empty room that you enter, and uh, once you start to move, you elicit sound, a sound environment, so your own movements produce sound, but the sound also affects your movements, or that's at least what he wants to achieve. And he says that uh, when he was interacting with the environment for quite a while and then left it and went on the streets, he immediately had the feeling that all the sounds he heard were reacting on his movements. So that's a, this idea that you can really be changed by an art experience that comes up or that, least that comes, came into my mind with this um, quotation. And these pr processes of aesthetic ex experience are closely related to another char characteristic of many contemporary artworks, which Ayn also emphasizes at another part of the book, which is their self-referentiality. This is a bit longer quotation. Art is seen as consisting of symbols that refer to something other than themselves, to a person's appearance, for example, or to a landscape, a lovely day, the movement of a body, a private space, a state of mind. In the most extreme situation, it refers to art as such. The difference between such non-interactive art and Gonzalez Torres' mountain of candy is that the latter does not invite reflection on that which is symbolized or on symbolization as such. It invites an action, a decision, a choice. Just for those of you who don't know the mountain of candy by Gonzalez Torres, so he uh, presents this mountain of candy that has the same wait as his partner who died from AIDS and invites you to take one candy and eat it. So in this way to participate on this reflection, even again in the kind of cathartic idea to get a part of this whole uh, process of reflecting the death of his partner. Um, okay, so back to the statement, because there are two important points in this quotation. So the first one is that art uh, or you might add that formally art often refer to something that is other than itself, but now often or in the most extreme situation, it refers to art as such. So that's this idea of self-referentiality in the arts, that art often reflects its own mediality instead of representing something in exterior. And this self-referentiality is in interactive art tied to action. The recipient is invited to act and this action has the potential to lead to reflection or understanding of the processes that he just experienced. 
So these thoughts really concern a crucial aspect for me of the aesthetic experience of interactive art, which is the relation of action and reflection. All with Ian's words, of course, this is not one to one the same, but he speaks about agents, the relation between agency and meaning. So let me focus a bit more in detail on the consequence of this action imperative, as you may call it, at, as we heard with the Lydia Clark, if you don't do anything, there is more or less no artwork. So Ian sees this development, this phenomenon, as a paradigmatic development of our contemporary society. We no longer merely are, we influence and are influenced. That is what the mirror of network art shows us. We do not assign meaning to things, for instance, by proclaiming them art, but act on them, are part of them. Agency is the new responsibility. The conceptual art of Duchamp and his crew has been surpassed by the network art of Gigo and hers. This is again, I think, very typical Ian, uh, Duchamp and his crew, and Gigo and hers. So that's, and hers goes, I think, up to nobotic research or something, so a really wide approach. Uh, putting people together to make his point. Um, so um, that, that, that this is where this uh, aspect of agency and um, the action imperative is uh, explained. And I'll come back to the notion of agency in a minute, but let me just first give you an example of how Ian traces this development back in 20th century art, because he says that Already with Kandinsky, the viewer has to keep changing position to see the image transformations in the still compositions. So already there, he has to move. And then in video art, the image transforms in the frame. And then he says, yet the viewer is not offered a chair because the viewer has to be to experience himself bodily. Th they have to remain conscious of their own body. So again, this is this idea of tracing back uh, action or active involvement in art history. But nevertheless, interactive art adds a new quality to this activation of reception. Because as an object, interactive art is nothing. If all you do is look at it, as you are used to doing with visual art, it will be a big disappointment. But as an action, it is everything. Then it allows you to know something you can understand only by doing. And then to other quotations, meaning is something that comes to life for a while in the interaction between the art and the viewer, and there is no meaning without agency. And we heard that already in his introduction. So that is for uh, Aryan agency describes the active production of meaning through the recipient's activity. That's how I understood it. And of course, in the discussion, maybe you would you want to clarify. But um, for him, agency is characterized by the individual's power to act out meaning in the art theoretical side, sense of aboutness, understanding. So this meaning doesn't have to be like a fixed symbolic meaning probably, but can be just an idea of interpretation and understanding. Um, this notion of agency is really interesting to me because in my own research, I use the term in a slightly different way, which is very typical for uh, art theory notions that they're used in many different ways, which also makes them very interesting normally. Uh, because I um, use the term of agency much more closely related to theories of play and um, also uh, digital literature. And in that context, agency is considered as, and I quote uh, a famous book by Janet Murray, Hamlet on the Holodeck, uh, she considers agency as the satisfying power to take meaningful action and see the result of our decisions and choices. So if we understand agency this way, I have considerable doubts about the recipient's agency in interactive art, or at least in interactive new media art. Because my view is that in many of these works, the processes of understanding enabled by the works are exactly fostered by subtle or provocative pre preclusion of agency. The recipient's plans are often disrupted, there, and this disruption, this going against the plans you may have, provokes an enhanced awareness and understanding. We had a uh, very um, 
early example for this, which is Myron Kruger's work, who makes you go through that maze, but then always counteracts your plans, your ideas by just changing the maze, changing the labyrinth. So disrupting your plans and uh, in the end, wanting you to reflect on the plans you have or your expectation of agency that is not fulfilled. So the action in interactive art does not necessarily result in an outcome that is meaningful in the sense of legitimating the activated process itself and that's the sense of agency from, uh, you understand it if you um, know that it comes from, from play theory, which deals very much with computer games. There, of course, agency is really the idea that I can act upon the narrative as if I would be there, that I can fight the dragon or whatever, so that I really can um, bring the action forward that is represented. But I think that is not this um, main point of meaning making that is important in interactive art. So. Um, in interactive art, the action does not necessarily result in an outcome that is meaningful in the sense of legitimating the activated process itself, but it can result in an enhanced understanding, sensibility or awareness of the recipient and um, in a kind of agency that Mulder refers to. And this is the point I would think might be interesting in the discussion, the relation between agency as a freedom to act and the restrictions set up through the interaction offer. So how do the two go together? What is agency in interactive art? Is it the power to take meaningful action or the power to actively produce meaning through action, which is two different things in my mind. I think this question is fundamental because it touches key questions of aesthetic experience, which are the relation between the recipient and the work and the question of aesthetic distance, and this is the last point I would like to share some, some thoughts with you about. Uh, so first, the relation between recipient and work. Um, without viewer agency, an interactive artwork is no more than a concentration of conditional readiness. This is also a term that um, comes up uh, some times in the book. Um, is no more than a concentration of conditional readiness of a potential for action. It requires activation. And Mulder, he refers to the relation between the interaction offer and its realization, or as I used to say, between interactivity and interaction. And in the next statement, he again comes up with this notion of a conditional ready readiness, but he makes clear that this relation is again very um, closely linked to the question of aesthetic distance. Conditional readiness is another word for virtual behavior that can be actualized by a statement, an object, a cursor, we had that, or a situation, these different kinds of uh, interactive art. Interactive art alienates us just enough from our own movements and choices to allow us to think about our responses and our behavioral palette. And I think this is really a very interesting statement because it touches this key point of aesthetic distance, which he describes as alienation. So in aesthetic theory, aesthetic distance is often regarded as a necessary condition of aesthetic experience or even as the necessary condition. For example, the German literary scholar Hans-Robert Jaus holds that it is a fundamental condition of aesthetic experience, the detachment of the reception situation from normal everyday behavior. Again, uh, it comes back to the beginning where I was talking about this readiness of the viewer. What is your own attitude towards the artwork or the interactive process? And of course, this, um, this condition is a key challenge for theories, not only of aesthetic experience in general, uh, but especially for interactive art, because it is here that the direct absorption in the aesthetic experience comes into conflict with the possibility of cognitive understanding of reflection. And this tension is accentuated in interactive art by the merging of action and experience. Uh, it becomes manifest amongst others if we discuss the various roles of the audience and their potentials of understanding or meaning making. It is an ongoing discussion in interactive art in how far onlookers, 
or even those who can rely only on documentation can come to an understanding of the work. And we could also discuss that in relation to the Rauschenberg piece, where you are only allowed to imagine how the interaction might function, but you're not allowed to interact yourself anymore. And there's also, and this is my last quotation from I in a very interesting one, the knowledge acquired by the interactors in an interactive piece of art is presentational, probably in opposition to representational also, an experience that can be had only in this one concrete way and cannot be generalized or abstracted. Yet the onlookers have critical distance and can thus draw ideas and possibilities from the interactive art and action in a discursive way. So I think this distinction between the, um, the presentational reception and the discursive um, reception is also very interesting and it makes clear that you can see advantages but also disadvantages in the active realization, respectively the distanced observation of an interaction process. So this relation between the effects of alienation in opposition, uh, of alienation, critical or aesthetic distance in opposition to action, immersion, and um, this cathartic experience um, really for me constitutes the key challenge of interactive art and also of researching interactive art. And this makes the study of it and the processes of active reception in general so fascinating. And I can't go more into detail on the topic here. Let me just finish by making uh, some general remarks related to it, that interactive art really, as um, I tried to make clear with this, some quotations from the book, challenges our notions of aesthetic and calls for new approaches to contemporary aesthetic production. Um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it also opens up new perspectives on art forms that we assume to have already understood, explained, or else. And that is what exactly the book does. It takes interactive art as a start and looks back on how it uh, develops the need to have new perspective on older or traditional forms of art also. And that, I think, is really a very interesting approach. So I can just encourage you to try to produce this third mind together with the text and to come up with new views on uh, art history, if not on art, arts history, if not on art history, maybe. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to go to Fritz now. I hope Fritz will have a good answer because Arjen was not so very nice on photography. And Fritz will talk about photographic experience and Arjen's book. I will do my best. <laughs> and I hope I can add to uh, what Katja said already. Um, first of all, I like very much to read Mulder, already for a long time. I read his book, Fotografisch Genoegen, which to my um, knowledge has not been translated yet. Um, his book on media theory <coughs> it was really a, a great pleasure. I think that Arjen Mulder is one of the few, if not the only theoretician in Holland on media art that manages to combine such diverse topics and fields of interest into his story. He has been writing on media and on the body, as you may all know, and on the experience of media, media for a long time. And it seems that From Image to Interaction is a logical follow-up on his book on media theory, although to be honest, I had expected a book on software theory, like he himself more or less announced in his media book. Anyway, he writes about media experience, but reading Mulder is certainly a media experience too. Afterwards, both reader and book have changed and something has happened between them. You should actually see my copy of the book now. <coughs> Mulder tends to take the reader on a joyful but risky ride in an intellectual roller coaster with the only certainty um, that you will finally be able to get out at the same point where you got in and perhaps buy yourself an ice cream. The experience is enriching and inspiring and you can be sure that your image of the world has been put upside down a couple of times before you had even time to realize it. 
And this is typical for Mulder. He has a sharp mind and a particular wit that allows him to make a knight's move on the chessboard every time he feels like it. And you will allow him to do so because you want him to move on, make it more exciting. You want, him to, f you want to follow him on his unconventional and surprising journey through history and theory towards the often bold and daring conclusions where indeed no man had gone before. That's what we call independent thinking and generous too. The other good thing about his writings is, uh, is that you don't have to be an expert to follow his logic. Although there will remain parts that he are hard to understand or are at least hard to understand for me. But I guess his own pleasure in thinking and writing can be felt throughout the text. <coughs> and that makes up for a good deal of it. There is often a certain gay casualness in his text that is catching, that has a catching effect on the reader. So we don't mind if he walks with seven league boots through history or comes up with funny new words as uber assemblage, the photo of a kijker, popgeluk, I've been reading the Dutch version, and calls Rembrandt the Mondrian brands, or en passant, corrects Walter Benjamin, the photograph is also or a producer, or even a whole generation of French thinkers. And we urge him, so to speak, to cross bridges and bridges between various disciplines and sciences more often and even faster, and to jump from biolog biology to art history, to religion, to genetics, within one paragraph, and still make sense. And finally, we follow enthusiastically in his footsteps when he leads us into the new paradigm change, stuck as we are until, uh, until our next into the so-called challenges that make up our daily lives. We may expect a different kind of life in the age of the computer and information networks, if only we are prepared to interact that is to change each other, put ourselves at risk to reach each other, to reach the other and to be reached by the other. This is how the book more or less ends. However, when asked to read more closely, and this is what I've been asked uh, from the perspective of photography and my position as a photography curator, things look a bit different. From the perspective of photography, the book is a bit silly you might say. And you might think when you have read the book, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> when I've read the book, I'm speaking from a certain defense position, seeing rather, you know, the meager image that he is uh, sketching uh, of the medium and its practitioners, its critics and its theorists. But in fact, I'm not. Firstly, because there's no need and secondly, because Mulder's statement is actually far too attractive. Nevertheless, I want to bring to the fore the following points in a quite random order. <clears throat> First, now I'm getting a more serious, I have difficulties with the lack of definition of the term art and its various uses in various contexts and times. I know it's hardly possible to define what art is or was, but it certainly was different in Botticelli's time or Abbey War Warburg's time or Renike Dijkstra's time. It is in fact quite astonishing that Franz Marx's painting uh, or paintings are still considered and even admired within the paradigm of contemporary, uh, contemporary definition of visual arts. But certainly this appreci appreciation of Franz Marx's works now is very different from that at the time when he made his paintings. And I will come back on this art issue later. Secondly, in my view, it's far too reductionist to limit analog photography to the time it takes for the film to register the image. I mean, this is the silly part. <coughs> That notion is still based on the Kodak myth of you push the button and we do the rest. It only takes a second. Yes, of course, a photographic image is technically, technically produced in a fraction of a second. However, the time to actually create an image is much larger. It is crucial for the understanding of the medium to know how photographers work and what they do in order to make a specific image. Professional photographers, and I won't call them artists for the moment, Professional photographers develop methods, ways of working, a certain choice of equipment in order to be able to make images that fit the way in which they want the world to be represented. That is based on how they have trained themselves, their eyes, their brains, to see certain things in the world that a normal per person doesn't see or to see the world in a, in a different way, in a certain way. Following that process is a sometimes even longer process in the dark room or the photo lab to produce a photographic print with certain qualities, texture, color, contrast, and so on. That is why photographs by different authors have different looks and feels. 
One may call that style or handwriting or language or whatever. And besides, I wonder whether we could somehow take into account that making a photograph is often very much a physical act of moving one's body through the space. Because framing is equally important in a photographer's time. A photographer is moving all the time, making strange steps, leaps and jumps. It is sometimes even compared with dance. Think of Cartier-Bresson or Martin Parr. Strength, speed, endurance and even risk can be crucial. Others are standing still, waiting for a long time, either because of a long exposure time or because the subject is not there as they want it to be. Look at Louis-Nicke Dijkstra, who is mentioned a couple of times in the book. But that's just a thought on the side. In any event, and that's my third point, if you don't see the difference between how images look apart from subject matter and why they look different, you certainly have to look again and longer. I'm convinced that the experience of the world by the photographer is somehow, and how is the question of theory, is somehow inscribed in a photograph. But you have to know how to look in order to notice. You have to practice. To state that certain photographers were not looking for a style, like for instance William Klein or Gary Winogrand, is not very convincing. Nothing so obvious and vain as the attempt to disappear from your work, as we all know for, uh, from, for instance, the writings of Hans Eismann, and I'm sure Ian knows them well. <coughs> Perhaps the following point, point four, is related to this. To take a photograph for reality is naive. But to state that a little piece of paper with an image looks like reality, as Mulder does in the book, is not much better. Maybe this comes from looking at photographs too much at this on, on the screen. But analog photography is a piece of paper with an image on it. Lens, camera, details, light, point of view, frame. There are so many aspects that define the look of an image. The truth might be that, what, that we have learned to read it as some sort of reality and that photographers have learned to use that visual language. In the sense that if their photographs do not speak that language, they would even not be recognized and accepted as such. Take, for instance, uh, uh, the, the numerous examples of people seeing their own photographic portrait and a photograph for the first time without even recognizing it. Most, if not all, documentary photographers make series of images, not single ones. <coughs> the work, if one needs to speak of a work as a work of art, is a series of images in a specific order, selection or edit, that tells a kind of story, and you have very specific stories and very abstract ones, and one needs to look at the series, ordered, as I said, in a specific way, in time. So it takes time to see the work, to see and understand it. Meaning is produced in between the images. Uh, the so-called third meaning, there you have the semio uh, semiologists again. Uh, but in between the images, that's where the meaning and the interaction is taking place. There is room for the viewer or the photo bekijker, a funny new word by Arjen, to contemplate and fill <laughs> uh, his or her own experience into this space, this virtual space. To consider a single photograph as a work of art is often a misconception and often stemming from effects caused by the museum and the art market that managed to incorporate photography as art in the 1980s. It is exemplary that Mulder refers to John Tsiolkovsky's book on Gary Winogrand, as Tsiolkovsky, the famous curator, was a kind of Clement Greenberg of photography, ever attempting to give photography a status similar to painting within the walls of the art museum, in this case the Museum of Modern Art in New York and actually on the base of its essentials, its medium-specific characteristics. Many of the so-called great masters of modernist photography were created by the museum and its curators. Mulder could have known had he had read the other part of the photographic literature that he mentions. Take documentary photographer Walker Evans, mentioned by Mulder as one of these masters. Evans already said it himself when, he was, when uh, photogra photography was addressed as an art form. Please don't, don't call it art. Call it whatever you want, but don't call it art. Photography is not an art form, it's a tool. It's used by, yes, amateurs, people that make commercials, that make commercials, scientists, the police even, and many others. Sometimes artists use it, and then perhaps certain photographs can be considered art. Not because of the medium, but because they are meant to speak or gain meaning within a certain very specific art discourse. 
And indeed, single photographs very rarely do. So generalizations about the media don't um, miss the point. Photography has hardly any coherence. That's maybe also the reason why there's so little theory on the medium. And um, I was wondering actually that the, the, the method that, that Ian Mulder uh, uses to analyze photography is um, in, in a way a kind of looking for its essentials and like a modernist method, you could say, which is not so much in line as what he does in the rest of the book, where he's looking for the spaces in between and not trying to fix anything. That certain photographs or even series are now seen by Mulder as kitsch is probably because they have been kitsch from the beginning. I fully agree, ever done. I hope there are not any fans here in the room. Or probably because somebody made it into something else, like in the case of the Beggers. Or perhaps we, because we have seen them over and over and over again. And this negative repetition effect may, alas, be inherent to the medium, indeed. Lastly, what puzzles me is why Mulder needs to spend such a large part of his book on a medium he considers redundant. And this is maybe my question. I was asked to ask him a question. Arjen, are you sure? <laughs> I doubt if these remarks will undermine Mulder's statement. And probably they don't. I hope not, because I am seduced indeed by the idea of the image as an interface, perhaps even as an organism with which we may interact. Who knows what may grow from all the junk pixels in a digital image? But images are no autonomous organisms in networks, or at least not yet, or at least not yet completely. They are artifacts created through technologies developed by us humans on the basis of possibilities, wishes, hopes, and expectations. What we should try to keep is the pleasure of looking at them without the expectations running too high. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I invite Arjen to have a seat here. Well, Fritz told me in the break he was not here for a defense of photography, but I thought it was something like that. And maybe it's a good thing to start right away with uh, uh, Fritz's speech. Yeah. In short, he tells you, well, it's not fair to bring everything back to the line and then say photography doesn't work. And he also says photography is not an art form, so why did you take me, put you, why did you put me in the book? I mean, photography. Could you respond to that? Yeah, I really enjoyed listening to Fritz. Uh, where are you? Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm very happy you defended it so eloquently and uh, showed me all the my black spots and blind spots and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Really good. I agree with you that uh, <coughs> you know the book is called From Image to Interaction, and then later on they sa said, should we say something about art in it too? So for me, it's about images and not so much about art. But anyway. The funny thing about photography is, as you said, you know, it is a sort of fate of photography that it had to become art at a certain point in the, in the history of the museum, basically. And that was, uh, I think it's, it's fatal for photography. If artists use photography, you get very nice works often, and if photographer starts to make art, they produce basically kitsch. Well, you know, there are very few examples, and that's why I mention Rineke Dijkstra because she thinks she's, she's one of these <coughs> examples that confirm the rule, basically. Anyway. No, but the question is, is phot photography redundant? That's, uh, I thought that was a very clever one. You see, if you consider photography from the point of view of interactive art, you know, and you look at this as an image, right? Here you have a painting, here you have a photograph. You know, instead of saying, you know, we have this whole body of work, etc. No, let's look at this one. You know, I, I, I give a very funny phenomenological description of a photograph, right? I say a photograph is a moving image, right? Because, you know, you take the image and you can move around with it. You have it in your wallets and in your, you know, you even have it in your own camera nowadays with the digital photography. So it's a moving image, right? <coughs> so what does this image do? Well, if you, t if you look at it from the point of view of time-based arts, uh, it is nothing more than just one second. You know, it took a long time to get to this one second or this one thousandth of a second as, as Winograd uh, used.
But then, you know, you only have one thing. If it, so my, the negative thing, looking from the point of view of interactive art, is that it doesn't contain time, and in that sense, it's not interesting. But looked at from photography, which I do very ex extensively in the parties, what does it show us? Well, it shows us space, right? Photography is about space. That's basically what I'm claiming, and it has, and I try to analyze very precisely the space experience as it is created by photography and the difference you get between analog and digital photography and film. Film I consider to be part of photography, right? So from the point of view of interactive art, it may be not that interesting, but from the point of view of photography, you know, apart from any considerations of art or interaction, it's still not redundant because we're still organizing our spatial ideas with m media like photography and film, right? So that would be my answer. Is it redundant? No, as long as we have to orient ourselves in spaces that we have to, you know, new spaces all the time. You know, it's a good idea to look at the, if you go to a new city, it's a good idea to look through the booklet, s look at the photographs, what does this space look like and how am I going to behave there, right? So, so it's not redundant. <laughs> but you said, for instance, uh, video art is dead because video is dead. There is no video anymore. Yeah, but that's a it's the same kind of provocative uh, announcement uh, you make, uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's easy for you to go to, to Renaissance art, frescoes, and yeah. uh, well, these painters are dead as well. Uh, uh, but in, in, in these historical uh, painters, you see, you see uh, living examples of media theory. Yeah. Why is it not possible to use photography or video art in the same way? Well, I suppose with video art it would work. I, you know, I thought, I, in, in, I described these paintings through certain painters who produced wonderful texts that I could read and analyze, and then I come up with a theory. And I thought, okay, I'll do the same thing with photograph, photo photographers. So I, again, read all the, I mean, I read, I basically wrote two books already about photography. And I read through all my library, what do I have? And I, there's no one who has a theory, you know? <laughs> there's no one. And then there are some funny theories of, of Bart and of uh, Benjamin, which are not really about photography. You know, that's why, that's why they are so good. And then there's a, lot, a big body and growing body of books about photography that mostly come from uh, academics in America, which is utterly boring because it's all, you know, he has said this and she has said this. And if we combine this, we can, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a discourse, it's a closed world. And I think that's a pity. It's, it's the end of photography because you know photography is has this illusion that it is about something else out there, which, which we could call the indexical value of the image of the photographic image. And uh, so I, mm, that's not that. But when we talk about video, it's different. Video art, you know, from the 70s started with these old machines. You know, where they had image lines, picture lines. You know, now they've just, they they have pixels, right? If you look at the old video art, it's all about these lines moving. You know, it's all, it's all these rippling streams, there's water, there are gardens of Zen gardens, etc. Et it's all about image lines, right? Which makes sense if you have a medium that has only image lines in it, right? Uh -huh. But as soon as you translate it or, you, you know, you copy it into a digital uh, format and you show it on a, on a pixel screen, you know, what the hell are all these lines doing there, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And the funny thing is that there are... Uh, some, you know, most of the, the video art is being sort of, it's not even copied, it's like represented in archives so in a digital format. And you think, you know, what am I looking at? Is this what the author meant, you know, or is this this moiré or, 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 or noise that's happening? Is that problem with the conversion of the one to the, you don't know. Uh -huh. So in that sense, I think it's not dead, but it's uh, utterly technolo technologically obsolete. So mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. problem for them. Mm -hmm. You keep stressing I'm the not. you keep stressing the line in your philosophy or your your ideas or your notions. Um, I think it's very interesting. It, 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 it makes it it makes it possible for you to leave from uh, Renaissance art to uh, contemporary art. Yeah. But um, how how important is the line, in fact, for Renaissance artists? I, I, I talked with Katja in uh, in the break. Um, well. I've, I've never seen those lines, to be honest. But so, so you, you showed me those lines more than that. But c could you elaborate on the on the idea of the line in Renaissance art? Yes. Is that possible for you to have a short?
Yes. Oh. Well, um, I didn't expect that. But no, I, know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, I think you're right that drawing and the line are very important in Renaissance art, and there was also this whole idea of the paragone, the uh, war, let's say, or the dispute between painting and sculpture, and painters referred to the line because of the idea that came up in the line. So this uh, painting is... Th or, uh, the artist as, as the thinker who makes up his ideas and therefore this, these ideas, the line was very important for them. So uh, I would agree on a, in this theoretical way that the line was really important in the process of image making. I wouldn't agree that it is generally important in all of the paintings. Like I wouldn't agree that Leonardo da Vinci is a proponent of the line mm. fraction because he's really like the sfumato is like what you learn in the first semester of study and that's not about the line. So I would, I would see this argument really more in the thinking and development process and not so much in all Renaissance painting. In the early Renaissance with Alberti, yes, but maybe not. In, with Michelangelo also, but not in all of the later ones. No, I noticed when I started to look at it more carefully that not everything was about, but I thought the argument is clear enough, so forget about the rest. Yeah, okay. I hoped you would turn it into a kind of question, and it's, it's, it's an idea for you, too, to respond. If you have a questions, please uh, stand up and have a question. Okay. Yes, but we're not going to talk about it now. <laughs> Lines as, a, as a, what's called a diagram. Basically, you talk about the diagram that's been introduced like 20 years ago. And uh, there's, there's the idea of Hogarth, right? The serpentine line. And that was not a contour line. There was a, a line that could like be any place in the paintings, sets of lines. And these lines would be intricate, right? What he calls intricate. So you follow them, but you can't because there are too many or they make very complex clusters or whatever. So there are forces. The lines are, are mapped forces or traces of forces. And they could be in uh, cave paintings of 20,000 years ago till interactive art. What I'm interested in is how do these moments of following, these feelings, right, the motif, right? If you have Susan Langer talk about the line as a motif, so you feel into the motif which is close to decorative art also. Why, where, at what point, because now you're saying, look, we, we, are, we are basically talking about 20,000 years of, of interactive art, right? Perception action blocks, because you, you follow a, an image through the line, right? So it's, it is, a, it is a, a map. Mm -hmm. Where does it become beautiful? And maybe, if I can just throw up something, maybe a, a 17th century uh, Cepolo would be more interactive than any nobotic research, so to speak. Uh, because it, it produces an effect that is not just creates agency, but actually agency of beauty, right? So there, there's a, there's an, an, the analysis of beauty is one of the line, but it produces that effect of beauty. Yeah, thank you. Well, I kept the analysis of beauty out of my book because I thought, you know, it, I think it is too early to, you know, to say what beauty in interactive art is, right? What kind of move, you know, you know see, there are artworks and I'm talking about the artworks with relational objects now where you did behavioral sort of interactivity, right? There are uh, interactive artworks where you feel you start to move beautifully, as in the work of Saiko Mikami, for example, you somehow start to get a certain grace out of it, right? But other works, you know, you basically you sit on your ass and then something weird happens, right? As in Ulrike Gabriel. But then the, 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 the robots move around in a certain, you know, is it beautiful? I don't know. I don't know. It's, the, a lot of it is such that I find it too early to say, you know, you can define what beauty is in interactive art. So that's why I'm very, that's why I'm very careful about it, and I avoid this sort of, you know, I, I avoid that line of thinking about um, well, how beauty is produced. Theory.
Yeah. Okay. But it's not particularly beautiful. <coughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that could be I would, I for would art criticism. Yeah, well, my, I suppose my uh, answer that, to that would be after you know, uh, writing the book, What is Beauty? I would say beauty is in art is anything that somehow either expands or deepens your feeling, yeah. right? Well, it's presentational meaning, as uh, Susan Langer calls it. You know, it's, it, she, she makes this distinction between discursive meaning, which is what you can talk about, and then you have the presentational meaning. You know it's there, but you can't talk about it. And that is the more interesting part. And, you know, it's the same with beauty, right? Okay, you can say, you know, beauty is a matter of taste, but you also know that sometimes somebody moves very beautifully, right? And what is it? I don't know. I find it too, too complex for me so far. Maybe, maybe it helps if you study dance theory. I don't know. Okay. The same is true for the formational uh, thing, you know, is, is formational uh, interactivity, you know, is the D tower beautiful? I don't know. Is the sound, of the, the, the sound piece we will hear later on, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, interactive composition, it's the, the grid producing a composition of sound. Is that beautiful? I don't know. I find it fascinating and I love listening to it and smelling it, but is it beautiful? Too difficult for me. Too difficult for me to. But what is very interesting, the way you talk about these artworks, uh, I like your presentation a lot. You show, you show a huge interest in art and you really seem to like it. You're really into it. You love it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I like the way you talk about how you express uh, what you think about it. But on the other hand, if, if I read your book, it's full of provocative statements about yeah. art. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> let's see, I, I, I have a yeah. few like, uh, where are they? Um, you talk about the quality of interaction, you prefer the idea of process, you dislike the notion of form, you criticize the idea of meaning as an autonomous category. Um, uh, interactivity is the new responsibility, video art is dead, action is everything, uh, no meaning without agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we started this evening, you said, I'm not doing art critique, I don't like art criticism. But if we add all these things up, Aren't you forming a kind of, aren't you formulating a, a kind of interactive art criticism well, ready to take over the world and to yeah. criticize art and art community in a much harsher way than your nice presentation just here? Yeah, and yeah, yeah you might do that, but uh, I wait a while before we start doing that. Yeah, I think Katja asked me, you know, about, or, or Fritz asked, what is art? And what is agency, right? These are the essential terms in the book, and I don't define them. Why? The good thing about art is nobody knows what it is, right? Every generation has to figure out for themselves what they're going to do, what they're going to call art, right? So if you have a state in a definition in the beginning, art is mm -hmm, agency is mm -hmm, you can study, you know, lots of things and then say, yes, this fits in my category, it's art. No, this doesn't fit in, so it isn't art. But that's not interesting, you know? If you take another definition and it fits. So that's why I didn't define these words. I was just trying to, to probe them, as Mark McLuhan would say, you know, just figure out what happens if you push them a bit or, or kick them every now and then, right? I don't know. And then the same is true with agency. You know, this is such a central notion. Why the hell do, don't I define it? Well, because I want to know what it is, right? That's why I don't know in the beginning. Well, I, I didn't just ask you what art is because no, I'm not it. interested yeah. in that either, um, I understand why Fritz asked it on the other way, but um, I think that the question, and also I'm not interested in what beauty is or where beauty comes into being oh, I'm also because in I'm more interested in the, this idea of, of aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. I'm, I was really a bit as astonished about the re relating this idea of beauty, especially to contemporary art, because I thought this is, for me, that's, that's not the main category. It may be interesting, but, uh, but, uh, but I wanted to come back to that notion of agency, because mm -hmm. I think uh, what also, what was my question, I think that <coughs> this is really important to state, because it's often also people say that interactive art is bad if there is not enough freedom of the recipient, if you are not able to influence things. So there are many artists nowadays who say, if interactive art is good, you really change society. It's still that voice idea, like also with net art, that you want to influence society, criticize society in a creative way. And there, I think, we come to this, we have to discuss the notion of agency. Is agency a kind of 
political agency, a creative influence of your environment, or is it really more uh, like a, th a theoretical thing of meaning making, of being able to make sense out of a work? So uh, like in, in an interpretative way, even if you do it with acting, I think this is an important distinction. You don't have to say this is a de my definition of agency, but just I would like to know how you, how you see this question. Well, you know, there is this uh, tendency in media art to want to change society through art, right? And through interaction, but, you know, and then interactive as in lots of freedom, democratic, etc. bottom-up organization, um, what else do we have, right? Non-hierarchical, uh, multilinear, etc., etc. et cetera. Well, there is something to it. I wouldn't deny it. Um, uh, but if you think of, for example, the, the we, we, you, you mentioned the, the, the candies of, uh, you know, you can only do two things with them, you know, either you eat them or you don't. You have hardly any freedom in this world. Yet, if you take the decision to eat it, lots of things start to happen, you know, even beauty is coming around in his works. I find it very beautiful, actually. I think he's one of the few you know, whose work I consider beautiful. I suppose, you know, and the same is true with, with the Ligia Clark thing, you know, you can either cut it this way or that way. If you do it this way, the work is over. If you do it that way, along the line, it becomes fascinating, right? So is it a matter of freedom? I don't know. I don't, I don't use the word freedom because it doesn't mean anything. Never, no, But, uh, but I don't think Katja was talking about freedom. She also was uh, talking about this choice. Social political implications of your thinking. You use words yeah. like interface, relationship, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, um, uh, participation. Mm -hmm. uh, you even told me I should do a book on participation in art. I definitely should. So, and when you read about it, it's not about it's not only a technical discourse. You're talking about the social, the physical as well. So you do talk about society. Maybe in yeah, but if an artist would do it, he would he or she would consider society to be the material where they work with, right? You know, this is. Interesting. Yeah. It's not you interesting know. to talk about freedom. It's more interesting to talk about an interesting form of freedom. Exactly. So then you start talking about uh, uh, rules or game sets or whatever. And then you uh, stop making an ordeal about if something is political or social, because then, you s then there starts a process of design in which you can uh, take a lot of decisions about how much freedom does the author have, how much freedom does the participant have, exactly. what kind of participants do I have. I mean, yeah. you can make uh, differences between onlookers, participants, and witnesses of traces, so you can make designs on all levels. And there is an interesting book about it, which is called An Architect of Interaction. Mm -hmm. Did you read it? Not yet. No. I thought it was from image to interaction. But no, but I don't this is another book. Mm. Thank and you very much. Yeah, another thing I thought was that you were talking about Duchamp. Yeah. And for me, it was Duchamp, and later it was uh, Ellen Kepro, uh, Moritz yeah. Cunningham, and John Cage. Kepro is also very much in the book, yeah. Okay. Yeah. For because that was for me very important that they start with juxtaposition. So the, the Kepro uh, describes for me very clearly going from uh, a collage, which is two uh, things in opposition, mm -hmm. and you start to create meaning, and from there you go to assemblage, so it's three-dimensional to environment, so you can walk in, into it to happening, where the audience is also part of the design. And that's yeah. making, that was making for me very clear how you can design interactive works. Yeah, reading Capro for me was one of the big eye-openers and inventions of, uh, uh, and, and, and discoveries of, of b on the theory level, because I think his, his, bo his books are amazing. His last one, a collection of essays, uh, was uh, on the blurring of yeah, life and art. The blurring between uh, life uh, and, 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 and art. art. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a really good eye-opener. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the idea that you have uh, art like art, you know, art that looks like art, you immediately <coughs> recognize it, and you have life like art, which mm -hmm. is something, you know, blurry. Blurry, yeah. yeah. 
and I think, you know, you mentioned participation art, which is, you know, socially involved, et cetera, et cetera. I, that's lifelike art, you know, if you do it like, it, it doesn't, all the older, all, all the, it's very hard to find any criteria for it to, to judge if it works, but somehow yeah. it is lifelike and in that sense very important. So yeah. I thought that was a, it was a really good uh, yeah. notion like for me also. And that's also what we did in this book, An Architect of Interaction. Mm -hmm. Because we made tools uh, for, a uh, toolkit for people who make interactive works. And what it did to ourselves was that we, start, we stopped ordeal, making ordeals about other artists. For example, in the beginning we said, well, uh, Alicia Frames uh, was really bad, you know, she only, she sleeps with people, and it's only one person involved in this interactive work, so that's, that's not good. But at, at the moment we made this toolkit and we saw, well, that's a, that's a decision, she, a design decision she made. So yeah. there's only one participant, and there are no onlookers, yeah. but maybe there are two million yeah. uh, witnesses of traces. So yeah. the ordeal goes away. And yeah. that's the reason we yeah. made it. Yeah. Well, the book is not, my book is not about the designing of interaction mm -hmm. or interactivity. But uh, I will read. I'm, I'm very happy that you <laughs> mentioned the other book. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lina. There's also a question raised by uh, the V2 flyer. And I'm not sure if you wrote it yourself. <laughs> and uh, I brought it with me. Yeah. And um, it, it was in a way, according to a V2 announcement, your book shows how visual culture has failed to connect to contemporary art. I thought, hmm, that's hmm, interesting. That's interesting. How visual <laughs> culture has failed to connect to contemporary art. We were supposed to give an answer to that. So. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, if you consider media the or, or media history as, you know, a follow-up of newer medias that incorporate older ones, you know, it's the, the classic idea of McLuhan who says that, uh, you know, the content of a new medium is an older medium, mm -hmm. right? So, and then you can say, you know, listen, what newer medium, what's the newest medium we have? Is that visual culture or is it something else? Well, I'd say it's something else. It's network culture. You know, mm -hmm. all images, as Fritz also mentioned, are part of networks, you know. They are not to be considered as single images. What I do is indeed totally silly and ridiculous. It took me a lot of effort actually to do it, you know. I had to skip so mm -hmm. much critical notions mm -hmm. <laughs> out of my head to be actually looking at a photograph and think, wait a minute, a photograph is a moving image. You can move it around all the time, you know, which is about the most stupid remark on photography that I ever heard, but it made me laugh for like 15 minutes and then I thought, <laughs> apparently I found something, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Why did nobody mention this before, right? Mm -hmm. so, okay. Anyway, so you could say that visual culture is the older medium that is one, at least one of the contents of the newer medium of, mm -hmm. of networks. No, I like the idea. So if you want to get rid of visual culture and, well, get rid and of decide it. not to speak about it anymore, if yeah. you want to talk about it in a different way, what, what, what kind of language shall we need? Well, read my book, you would say, but... I suppose you would go into programming. Network culture? No, I suppose you would go into programming. programming. If, you, if you don't want to talk about images or use images anymore, what, what have you left, you know? Mathematics, I suppose. No, but I mean um, the whole phrase of visual culture. Everyone uses visual culture. We're yeah. living in a visual culture. We're living in yeah, well, we what, do. What's the kind of work? You, what, what kind of word you would like to uh, to use for that? Is that network culture? Oh yes, I would pr pr uh, probably network culture. Yeah, well, culture, you know, culture, culture. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Networks. Networks. Yeah. That works. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any questions from the audience, maybe? <sighs> Everything is clear, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think it's time to get back. Maybe I have a, a small last one. Everyone likes the idea of how you, how you mix up history, leap from the Renaissance yeah. to our times, yeah. go back to modern painters like Clay yeah. and Mondrian, and skip back to Leonardo da Vinci, and start talking about the Rauschenberg. Uh, at school, of course, we learned everything about the, the, the crime of anachronism, mm -hmm. and we were not supposed to do that. For instance, you know, if you would study ancient Rome, and you would say that's a class society, they yeah. would say, oh no, it's not a class society because the notion of class was not Didn't there. Exist. Um, 
You know, the good thing about network culture is that everything is information. Mm -hmm. It's all data, right? If it's from the Renaissance, if it's from the, from the sociology, if it comes from any, it's data, right? It's all the same, right? You just push it through, a, through the digital format and it's all the same. So you can combine anything you like nowadays. That's the new So history is just a dustbin without meaning? No, no, no. You can create imme incredible amounts of meaning out of it. You know, that's the good thing about it, mm -hmm. right? But it's basically a huge database, right? The idea of anachronism is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, Who's, well, you know, this 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 bit is older than that bit. No, it's all bits are the same in it. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you take that si condition, which is the current condition, seriously, you can start to combine anything you like, right? It gives you an incredible amount of freedom. You know, okay, of course, you can say, you know, nobody knows history anymore. People know more about history than ever, right? But they don't know it as a chronological story, but as a database. Mm -hmm. Use it, I'd say. Okay. I would say, he says use it. I would say read it. <laughs> the book is still on sale. Well, thank you very much for this evening. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>